understanding crown architecture, how we can prune our trees to really maximize seed production and where do we put our efforts. So I, I, that's the thing I take away as something we need to invest in, as well as the species that are newer to our tree improvement programs that we don't have that same reproductive biology background. Without further ado, and, and the reason we've also asked Graham to speak is try to find someone with expertise in conifer reproductive biology in North America. It's a very rare. Dr. Powell, formerly Dr. John Owens, Dr. Patrick Von Atterkis are really the only main three go-to guys that I know of. There is another fellow, Bert Craig, I'm a little bit aware of, but his issue is preventing cones from occurring on Christmas trees. So it's a very interesting spin on things. But without uh, further ado, Dr. Patrick Van Anderkes, professor at University of Victoria. Thank you. Yeah, okay. The green one and then this one is the pointer. Oh, excellent. Okay, I'd like to thank Dave and Melissa for inviting me to give this talk. Oops. Turn this one off. Okay, all right. Um, so as a biologist at the uh, Center for Forest Biology at the University of Victoria, um, you know, we have, we ha acknowledge the territory on which we stand, which of course is the unceded land of the uh, Lekwungen First Nations, um, and as well as the Esquimalt and Wasanich peoples who still have strong ties to the land. And the reason I mention this as a seed biologist is that I understand what that relationship is and what seed are meant to do and what ideas they're meant to generate. And since our university has sort of changed its orientation as a very strong indigenous uh, strategy involving uh, indigenous law faculty and other things, we're actually noticing that students are, you know, first year, first nations, first year students are coming to UVic to study marine biology and tree biology. So seed biology is very attractive. Um, my sincerest thanks to Graham Powell for outlining that so beautifully. It saves me quite a bit of time. Um, his talk is basically optimistic, uh, whereas mine is based on the experience of what can go wrong and is therefore more cautionary. Okay, so the title, Comedic Selection, and what is comedic selection? Well, it's really loosely defined as transmission distortion, and when we aim to get improved seed, we're hoping for successful mating, of course. And what if we don't get what we want? What if we don't get what we want in the seed that we finally get at the, the, uh, the pipeline at the other end? And so let's break things down where they can go wrong. Some of these are big issues. Some are really academic issues that would only interest people like me um, and might be nuanced. But on the other hand, they also, I'm putting them out there because they're not solved. They need some serious attention, whether biochemistry oriented or physiology or just plain morphology. So let's get you in the mood. Um, okay, I'm gonna break it into three parts, bad buds, bad fathers, bad mothers, and one backwards and forwards, you'll find out what that means, and then embryo death, so why not end on a disastrous note? <laughs> um, and here we have lodgepole pine. I'm just throwing this up there as a brief reminder that nothing is as short as balsam fir. Um, so in year one, something happens, in year two, quite a bit more happens, and then finally in year three, finally in year three, finally in year three, like you don't put a PhD student on a project like this, they don't get too many kicks at the cat over five years. Um, and that's when we get the seed. It also explains why there's a shortage of seed biologists. You have to be out of your mind to study something like pine for a degree. Um, okay, so the good news, of course, is that at the beginning there are few worries if you're a seed orchardist. In year one, uh, things are not so bad. Um, and part of the reason is that the early events are quite simple. You have bud flush, initiation of female cone bud formation, pollen bud formation, cone and pollen bud differentiation occurs in late summer. So this is kind of very predictable and not too much to worry about. The one thing that really can go wrong, I suppose, is uh, in the second step. And so the initiation of female um, cone buds and pollen buds during early summer, well, if you're brand new to the game, 
you have to know what happened in the previous year because it's very difficult to get two bumper crops in a, in a row. In fact, it's virtually impossible. Um, so if the previous year had a bumper crop, well, you're up the creek without a paddle. Uh, if you do use GA induction for things like lodgepole pine, and you're first around the block on this, you have to be very careful about when you apply it because some of the literature out there um, implies that you can uh, put these things on a bit later in the season than you really can get away with. If you uh, miss the date, you've missed the ball. The invitation's over. So those are things where you have to pay attention to phenology. And that's what Graham Powell did in his very nice book. I took it out of the library just before I uh, wrote up this talk, and I thought, it's really a very nice uh, narrative arc on any species that's common in Canada, for sure. So knowing your phenology is really important. Now, if we move to female bud formation, it's also happening in the first year, and there's nothing too exciting going on there. Um, and at the end of the year, we have winter, and nothing happens at all, so you can relax. So few worries, then this is followed by relaxation, a holiday south somewhere, and then, I'm sorry, Martha, this is where the crap hits the fan. All the worries are really in the middle. And fortunately, there are these wheel diagrams for a number of species, certainly here in BC. Um, if you're working on a brand new species, I'd encourage you to generate one yourself, just as a very solid exercise on how to get a grasp of where the things are that you might have to worry about with any given species, whether it's a conifer, for which we have many of these diagrams, or maples, or something brand new, or birches. And what this wheel diagram really is, it's very simple. You have um, vegetative bud flushing here in April, then May you get the beginning of initiation, and then you can see as July and August roll through, you're getting differentiation, and then finally at the very end of it, you have dormant buds. So that's your first year. And then all of these great events happen, all the meiotic events, all the differentiation, fertilization, pollination, it's all stacked into that year. I'm picking a two-year cycle here as opposed to the three-year cycle of lodgepole pine because the two-year cycle is much more common. You know, true firs and cypresses and cedars and so on all conform basically to this. And so these diagrams are quite useful. So we've already discussed what goes on in first year, and now it's time to move on to what goes on in second year. And at the end of it, you get seed, but along the way, there are different things. In the case of Douglas fir, we have male development, virtually precedes female development, which is quite slow, and most of female development. Then we have uh, fertilization, which is interestingly portrayed there. It looks incomplete in my diagram. And then you get seed, of course. So what sorts of problems uh, can occur that are really relevant here? So male cone development, the male butt flushes, meiosis takes place, pollen develops, and it's released from the pollen sac. And some of the problems, uh, you know, traditionally you have, certainly when you're starting with pollen, is that you collect incorrectly. You collect too early. You take branches, for example, and put them in a pot, expecting that they're just going to sort of mature and shed the pollen. Um, but if you're doing that with um, material that you've collected a little bit too early, it will never mature. Meiosis gets screwy, and um, you end up with really useless pollen. Um, having said that, though, in general, pollen collect collection is not a problem for almost any commercially important species because we've worked it out. We've worked it out in great detail. In fact, this is one of those parts of the reproductive cycle that has got a solid, solid literature, a solid practicing population of seed orchardists who understand how to use scientific uh, equipment to get oxygen readings to actually test the material so that they can store it correctly. And this is kind of a benchmark of how reproductive biology has actually delivered something practical in terms of being able to take gametes and store them for a long, long time. So if you're new to a species, and that's actually one of the more exciting things that's happening these days, is that more species are coming into our you know, focus, um, is don't reinvent the wheel. Just talk to a pollen expert. And it isn't just you know Graham Powell and Jack Owens and myself 
I mean, most orchardists understand how to do pollen biology really effectively. So this is very reassuring. Um, there are pollination problems, though. Getting the timing of application can be wrong. In other words, pollination itself uh, can be missed if one isn't paying attention or the holidays fall in the wrong order. Um, shouldn't happen if you're paying attention to female cone development. Again, it's a note on phenology. Know your phenology cold. And of course, we do e exclude pollen clouds from neighboring uh, tree, wild tree sources. And it's always good to put, it, put together a poly mix, of which I'll come back to that a little bit later. So the female cone development, it flushes. Meiosis takes place. The megagametophyte matures. So here you have an ovuliferous scale with a megagametophyte that's developing here. And then eventually, we'll put up, let's just say in the case of Douglas fir, it'll put up four or five archegonia. Each archegonium, one egg. That means that it's a potential of four or five embryos. So that's occurring. And at the same time, you have pollen development and uh, pollen release. And so you're going to have pollination. And in the case of Douglas fir, it's two months before you get fertilization. Well, it can be shorter, but it's of that order. And where are the problems? Well, some of the problems are banal, that you have no control over whatsoever. I'm thinking larch in this case, late frost, that'll just knock half the cones off those trees, no problem. Um, but there's also, in the pollen bud development, the possibility of meiosis going really skew-whippy. And I'll show you a picture of just how spectacular that can be. It's not that common, but you should be aware that this can occur. Um, you need excuses for your, to your managers. And I'm just providing you with a, a laundry list of them right now. And then B, pollen-ovule interaction results in pollen uh, selection, gametic selection, really. And um, I'll go into that in a bit. And then make gametophytes abort, and that's possibly meiotically driven, but it could be physiologically. And that's kind of this bad mother thing. So here's an example from Vivian Wilson and Jack Owen's paper, about 2000, somewhere around there, where they show western white pine. And those are microsporangia with nothing in them. They're gutless. And meiosis has gone wrong. Either that or tapetal development has gone sideways. And so that's a possibility. It's uncommon, but not rare. Um, then pollen ovule interactions. So this is a Sitka spruce. And if you can squint really tightly, you can see the little golden orbs that are sitting there on the bracts. Those, of course, are losers, because to be a winner, you have to be right down in the central axis of that, um, of that cone. Um, and in fact, you don't have to just be on the central axis. You have to be caught by one of these micropylar flaps. So this is the tip of the ovule. If you imagine my balding head here as the ovule, and these are these micropylar flaps on the top. And then this is a pollen grain that has landed and is stuck. So the interesting thing about sticking there is it's not a neutral condition. The sticking itself sends a signal. And that signal, we don't know what the hell it is, it's after all these years, uh, pro causes a response by the ovule. And the response was kind of spectacular. And it sort of occupied about 20 years of my research. So this is Andrew Leslie's work from Yale. And here he shows um, Austrian pine or black pine. And there you see these micropolar flaps. And you can see the pollen grains that are stuck on it. And then 30 minutes later, or say half an hour to an hour later, we get the pollination droop ex drop exuding from the ovule. And the pollen grains now are released from that little flap. And they're free to float up into the ovule. So it's a wonderful system. And many of the conifers and gymnosperms, so here we have yew and pine and then the, you know, some sister gymnosperms like ginkgo and ephedra, all produce these wonderful pollination drops, which are full of all sorts of things, proteins and calcium and carbohydrates. But the important thing is that they're the vector, the vehicle for these things to move, for pollen grains to move inside the ovule. And so they represent the first contact, the first moment of pollen-ovule interaction. They're quite critical. 
So just to show you how little we do know or how we can manipulate the little that we do know to good effect, um, there was some very nice work on spruce hybridization. You take spruce species A, you know, I mean, you could argue that spruce is a very weird kind of almost a species complex, and spruce species B, and you want to introduce the pollen, the gametes from B into A, then here is the tip of the ovule of A in both conditions. And what we have here are this pollen from A, which has been irradiated, in other words, exposed to cobalt-60, the nucleus is non-functional, but the pollen tube will grow. Or maybe it's even dead, it could be heated. Some of the experiments do that. And then here we have the living spruce B pollen. And so you introduce them together. And what happens is the dead pollen, or the irradiated pollen, sends a signal to its mother that things are great, it's been pollinated. Why is that important? Because spruces do something strange, like they're, Douglas fir won't do this, but um, if it doesn't get any pollen, the cones just abort. So for some reason it knows how to, I'm not saying count, it can't count, but it knows when there's an ample sufficiency of pollen to keep going. And so this provides the ample sufficiency signal, whatever that is, and the result is that a pollination drop comes out an hour later, and then up float all the living pollen, and the possibility of the hybridite, hybridization event uh, is made manifest. So it's an interesting situation of how you can take gametes to manipulate very odd kind of um, genetic events. Okay, but in general, when we talk about pollen, we're talking about pollen sweepstakes as if it was a horse race. It's always described as a horse race. You have all these different pollen from polymix coming in. They're all now competing. And a horse race is like really overstating it because a horse race, is a horse race is fast. But for spruce pollen to make the clubhouse turn, you know, that takes weeks to a month. For Douglas fir to do it, it takes around two months. It takes a lot longer than this. So this is um, the handicapped horse race. All the horses are hobbled. You could argue with pine pollen that the horse is possibly dead <laughs> because it takes over a year. And do you think that's unusual? There are 13 genera among the gymnosperms that take a year or more to arrive, a year and a bit. So if you think of that as a pollen tube growing, that's a very slow event. It could also be interpreted as a very slow selective event. Right. So now we're going to talk about backwards and forwards and the consequences of this. So it was generally assumed, and Don Fowler wrote the paper on this in 1987, and um, I was in among this cast of characters. I'm the one holding the sandwich, always eating, getting taller. Um, and he made certain assumptions about the pollen, and we actually assume these generally when we do backwards crosses, that the mix is equally effective in pollination, the components of the mix. So when we have backwards selection, we assume no prezygotic selection. I'm not telling you anything new there. There is really no evidence for it. It assumes all pollen are equally competitive. That's Fowler's statement, and that's what really is the basis of a lot of since the 1940s, backward selection. And as a result, we use polymixes of parents, parents of good offspring. But because of fabulous advances, really, in the use of marker-assisted selection, genomics being able to, um, to sequence cheaply and effectively, and that's only getting better, we can really envisage forward selection methods and People who have used these, whether it's Elk, um, you know, Usri or whether it's um, Trevor or other people, um, the assumptions are somewhat the same, no prezygotic selection, but the evidence that's turned up from other studies by Lenz and Vidal, et cetera, is that the pollen generally conforms to being equally competitive, but you can pick out the extremes now. You actually can pick out the ones that are faster, the ones that are slower. You can pick out the ones that are bigger contributors, occasionally when that happens. And so 
what, is the, what was theoretically possible is now with sequencing proven to actually happen. And as a result, we don't have to use polymixes of parents of good offspring, but we can use pollen from superior offspring. So we can skip ahead, as it were. So that's a possibility. And that's because genetic markers are getting better. And you know, if I had to start my whole career over, I'd started right now doing the same thing except getting all of the genomics tools on board because the possibilities are really interesting in starting to dissect what we can actually find happening inside ovules. Um, so differential reproductive success, or DRS, um, is not that common to be able to pick it out, but we can, and it is gametic selection at work. So now we're down to the final bit here, embryo death. We have a pollen grain that has a pollen tube. This is Douglas fir in a longitudinal section. It's delivered its gametes into the egg. So one of the gametes fuses with the egg nucleus. And so then we have the baby. We have the zygote. And this is now a seed. And this is, of course, ultimately what we're hoping to produce. And at this point, a lot of selection does occur. And this is, in part, gametic selection, but also, uh, you know, a lot of it's zygotic selection. We have two archegonia here in this section. There would be four or five in Douglas fir. This is Douglas fir. And they produce a zygote, produces a now growing embryo, and the embryos grow into the mega gametophyte. So they pop through the archegonial jacket into the mega gametophyte, and they're competing in this corrosion cavity, this area that's breaking down and supplying them with nutrients. And so we know that if we have incompatible crosses, that they abort pretty early. You know, if you have a lot of um, you know, lethal alleles that are exposed at the same time, then you're not going to get much past the zygote. You can get further, that's for sure, before the bad stuff appears in incompatible crosses. Uh, but you could also have crosses that are more effective, that are faster. And so now this is the second part of the horse race, really. And is it literally horse race? Well, this one is the horse race to the death, and it's much faster. Because what we have here are embryos competing. Here we have one that looks very nice, but it is going to lose because it's behind this one. The one in the tip of the corrosion cavity is always the winner, and it crushes, literally crushes, its half-sibs to death to take the dominant position. So it's ugly in there, um, but the race is definitely on. So there can be many embryos, but there's only one winner. Now, the lead embryo uh, takes this position, but what happens in something which is much closer to gametic selection, like the most obvious one that you can think of, which is selfing? Selfing leads to in, in pine, certainly 95% of the um, seed out of a selfed cross is, is going to be empty seed. It's, it's a, it aborts. And what we actually know from Claire Williams' work is that much of that abortion, like a disproportionately high amount, not all of it certainly, but a disproportionately high amount, takes place when the embryo, the selfed embryo, penetrates into the corrosion cavity, which is clearly a mother-daughter incompatibility because they're half related. Actually, they're completely related. And so somehow, this translates into death. And how that occurs, we don't know at all. And you know, I've spent a long time picking away at the biochemistry of a lot of these different things and the physiology and the morphology. Um, so there's just tons left here to do in terms of research, like the opportunities for academic researchers coming up with answers to applied questions are great. And they will reveal other things. It's not that you can close the door and say, oh, selfing's not a good thing. What I'm telling you is that understanding selfing opens the door to understanding less compatible crosses and compatible crosses. So it's to give you hope in death. Right. So in terms of worrying about the, growth, the, the gross effects of gametic selection, on uh, you know, subtle and interesting aspects of selection, um, you really only have to concentrate by definition in two parts of this. So no worries. Time to worry.
too late to worry. So there you have this narrative arc of Graham Powell broken down into neuroses. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? What's that? We'll have to hold questions, okay. Big green arrow next. Does that what actually happens? Oh, okay. Hopefully, I won't need to go back. Uh, it worked. Hi, I'm Rob Taylor. I'm the seed orchard technician at uh, Skamekin Seed Orchard. Um, yeah, I just flew in from Papin, and boy, are my seed wings tired. Kind of a little seed humor I just thought of. Um, so welcome to my talk on Pine Orchard 352, that's going to be Conceit Orchard, and differences in seed production um, and the site factors that I think may be responsible for them. Uh, that's all my notes there, all right. A little bit about the parent trees. Well, the parent trees for Pine Orchard 352 come mostly, there's Prince George over there, up around Williston Lake. So northern parents. And here they are planted in uh, Tappan, BC, just near Salmon Arm. So I stratified it into uh, two units because we noticed some differences. We have what I'm gonna call sand up on the hill, sandy soils, of course, vitamin content is pretty high, um, doesn't hold water that well, IDF MW203, and silt down low, receiving site, holds water really well, nice and shady down there. That's the breakdown of the relative size. And uh, right, so 2016, this orchard came into production and ever since then, everyone who's ever worked in it has said, hey, there's bigger cones down in silt. There's more cones on the trees down in silt. I wanna pick down in silt. Well, all of my production will be way higher. But we don't really care about cones, we care about seeds. So in uh, 2020, I think this was Stephen Joyce's idea here to take credit, there he is, I think it was your idea, but we did a fractional seed lot um, that year between sand and silt, because we wanted to see, of course, what seed production is like. Are there significant differences? And if there are, why? Uh, I propose that site factors influence seed production. These two sites are right next to each other, we manage them pretty much identically the same. So here's the results of the seed lot. It's been a long time since Marilyn <laughs> sent me these. It's been, yeah, things take a while. So again, there's the breakdown of how, how many ramets are in each uh, strata there. And uh, hectar legions of cones. Well, you can see the silt trees produced punch above their weight, right? They produce 27% of the hectar legions of cones because there's more of them and they're bigger, obviously, no surprise here. But really, that's like a 28, that's 28% more than expected. 21 times 1.28 being 27%. But yeah, cones, but we're a seed orchard, not a cone orchard. Kilograms of field seed, which is what we all care about. This is where the rubber hits the road, right? Um, silt produces 34% of the uh, kilograms of field seed. That is quite a lot more, that's 62% more than it really should be producing, right? So, hopefully you'll agree with me, this is a significant difference. That's good to know, that means I can go on with my presentation. Why are there differences? I propose it's site factors. Here's a little plan and profile of the site. I've got the snow load on, on there, that's what that white is, it's snow. Um, some of the big site factors, well, Mount Tappan to the south, um, I'm gonna walk over here. I think I wanna be over here. That way you can see my new shoes that I bought. Um, Mount Tappan in the south, throwing shade on uh, silt. Water and cold air tends to move downhill, don't be surprised there. Little bit of shade 
and cool air from the windbreak down in the south. You can see the windbreak trees there. And speaking of windbreak, in general, it's less windy in silt because it's more protected, right? So what we get every year, this is one of the uh, places where snow melts first on the site, and especially in this orchard, it'll melt in whatever, mid-April, depends on the year, and uh, two or three weeks later, we'll get late snow melt and silt. So you can see there's a difference right there caused by these site factors. Based on uh, things I've read and what smarter people than me have said, I kind of suspect that there's lower evaporation in silt, higher evaporation in sand, probably, question mark, of course. And uh, one thing I wish I had measured but didn't, but we are measuring it right now as I speak. I got a Kestrel dongle that I got from Jeff in each of these sites. Um, I would like to measure the lower, I think there's probably lower air temperature in silt overall and probably higher RH, right, in the air. We'll find out those are some of the big differences. Um, drill down a bit into site factors and back analysis. Those are some of the big differences. The main one really is this one. You can see that silt, it's a soil texture, 16% sand, 58% silt, 26% clay, coarse fragment content like gravel, cobble, 2%, like pretty nice. Or sand, 72% sand, that's the name, sand. Silt, 22%, clay, 6%, and then a lot of gravel, 45% gravel. Um, these are indicator plants, so they're not really site factors, but they're expressions of site factors. And if you put that through a edotopic grid, this is a draft one, it's not released yet. When it is released, I'm sure it'll look a little bit different, but I say that sand is an O3 site series, a little bit of an O1, and I say silt is an O5 site series, also a little bit of one. This is kind of hard to do on a, on a disturbed agricultural site. Soil textures are all mixed up. Uh, forest edge effect, all the plant associations are a bit goofy, so kind of hard to read. If I'd been able to find some, um, some um, Devil's Club, I'd wanting to say it's more close to an 06, for example. So, big difference in site factors, but maybe it's genetics. Maybe it was the grafting, maybe it was planting and establishment and stuff like that. Well, I would say no. All parents, all 72 parents uh, are present in both strata equally, 1.39% each. And a theoretical um, seed lot, if you do it through PCEP, you get a theoretical seed lot, GW, they're almost, almost identical, right? So genetically the same. Uh, grafting. Done in Kalamaka. I'm not sure of the exact dates, um, but Petra, Nancy, Faye, et al., right? Very experienced, very professional, good at their job. They were, they did um, all the grafting, so in all the, in both strata. Those strata were my invention like a couple years ago. Planting was all done in a narrow window by the same people, by the same way. So no real differences in establishment there. Um, genetics being the important one. Uh, we manage the site, the orchard, the same. Everything gets done the same. The only thing that isn't the same is the irrigation. We've got two irrigation zones, an upper and a lower, north and south, however you want to say it. There's the rows, one through 60, 60 rows in the orchard. And we have soil moisture um, meters taking uh, soil moisture, three sensors each by which we were making irrigation decisions, for better or worse, and those are the decisions we made. So we irrigated upper 11 times. Each tree got 456 liters of water, whereas lower, quite a bit few times less water. So the upper zone is all sand, but the lower zone is kind of a combo. And this polygon sort of sticks out, because these are sand trees that, we, that are in the lower irrigation zone, so they were watered as if they were in here. So they got a lot less water than maybe they should have. We tried to manage for that, but it's operationally difficult. So what was seed production in there? Maybe it was really low, maybe there was none, maybe that's why there's the big difference. Well, we don't know, because we didn't measure that, but there's no observations in cone cuts or anything that seed production was lower in there, but again, 
We don't know, so that, that is a question. But what we do know, we have some information from a study Frank, uh, Frank, Frederick Vroom led in uh, 2021. Um, and amongst other things, we could, um, we, were, we were measuring how many sacks, how many trees it took to fill a uh, 20 liter sack of cones, right? Here's the rows on the x-axis and on the y-axis is the number of ramets it takes to fill a 20 liter sack, lower and upper irrigation zones. And these ones stick out here. This is that same uh, rectangle from before and these rows stick out here. So in row 20, for example, it took uh, eight sacks, sorry, eight trees to fill up a 20 liter sack of cones. So probably fewer cones, probably smaller. So is that because of irrigation? Um, I kind of want to suggest that no, it isn't because these other sand trees in the silt zone were watered the same way, but their production seems to be pretty good. Like three trees to fill up a sack, very much in line with their adjacent compatriots there. So I don't think those ones around row 20 is because of irrigation. I don't know what it is though. It's not because it's the steepest slope, some sort of site factor. I'm not sure what it is, but something. So. Another question, that's two questions. Ah, right, from irrigation to moisture content, hot, skip, and a jump. So, this is the field capacity and wilting point for our silt soils. And because it's a silt soil, it's a pretty good field capacity, 34%. Wilting point, 17%. Everything in between there is the available water. And then halfway is the AW50, the available water, 50%. And the uh, bumpy line there is the moisture content at our base um, sensor in silt. What is it I speak of? What is a base, what do I mean base sensor? Well, you can see in my little diagram here, I went to art school. Um, we've got three sensors, two of them, surface and root, are sort of inside the zone that actually gets irrigated by our one emitter per tree. The base sensor is outside of that area, so it's telling us what the uh, soil moisture is independent of any management techniques that we do, i.e. irrigation. So that's reliant on site factors like slope position, soil texture, um, evaporation, shade from Mount Tappan, for example. So back to the graph, where you want your field capacity is, sorry, your soil moisture is nice to have in between the field capacity and uh, the AW50, it's a nice sweet spot. If it drops below the AW50, it gets progressively harder for the tree to get the water out of the soil. So that's looking pretty good. Mother Nature did that all by themselves, by herself, without any help from us. Um, we helped here. That's 10% of the roots. Uh, Mother Nature is is working on 90% of the root zone, right? Oh, oh, no, 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 went backwards. Now we can put the uh, same sensors for the sand on here as well, also for um, the base moisture content. And it fits on the same graph because the field capacity of a sandy soil is a lot less at like 14%. So this is the silt, this is the sand. And the main takeaway here is that the sand base moisture content, thanks to mother nature, is only able to keep the uh, moisture content pretty much in between the uh, AW50 and the wilting point. There's a couple places where it did pick up some irrigation events, but in, uh, you know, if this is in the sweet spot, this is in the sour spot um, for the 90% of the roots, not the 10% that we irrigated. Um, so that big difference can only be due to site factors, kind of obvious, so, um, the uh, soil, soil texture, slope position, Ah, right, another question. So, like I'm wondering, can that 10% of a tree's roots supply enough water for good tree health, right? I don't know, I'd kind of like to know. Someone here might know and say that's an obvious, maybe there's an obvious answer to that. Ah, right, Con connected to tree health, vapor pressure deficit. Uh, three basic takeaways about VPD from Jeff Bradley's talk in 2021. Note, he did not draw the pit, the picture of the tree, wanted me to make sure I said that. I didn't draw it either, we both stole it from the internet. But it dries evapotranspiration, the tree has to suck water out of the ground through the tree and out into the air. 
Uh, you can calculate it from temperature and RH. Remember that thing I didn't measure and want to measure? And I'm measuring now. And uh, helps estimate the water stress that plants is experiencing. So how important is that? Well, I need a drink of water. If you guys read that, I'll have a drink of water. So Williams et al, 2013, they thought it was, he thought it was pretty important, like more important than larger climate issues. So thinking back to our last graph, here's the soil moisture for the silt trees. Now you're a tree in silt, you've got vapor pressure deficit issues and evapotranspiration and water stress. You have a lot of water resources in that 90% that isn't irrigated beyond the 10% that is to deal with those issues. You're in a nice spot, thanks to the site factors because it's all dependent on, on uh, the soil, the moisture holding capacity of the soil, basically. Whereas if you're in silt, you have a lot fewer water resources available to deal with the same issues. These trees are only like 20, 50, 100 meters apart, managed the same. The dip main differences here are the site factors of the slope position, soil, soil uh, texture. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Back. This is sand, yeah. That's sort of like the available water between the, uh, the uh, moisture content percent in sand and the wilting point. Right? Anything below here isn't available because the tree can't get it out. Hope that makes sense. Um, right, fertilization. So the orchard wood is fertilized all the same. This is from 2019. Every year we sort of, I sort of like grab some other information on this, on this orchard to back up my argument here. Um, 2019, so fertilized all the same. But in eight cases out of 12 of the elements that we track, um, silt, as indicated by the blue color, had higher, uh, higher nutrient levels than sand did in eight out of 12 cases. That seems significant to me. I don't know how significant these um, differences are, 3%, 50%, 13%, as far as specifics about the tree health and seed production very complicated. I would ask Claire Kustra more about that. I would ask Jeff Bradley more about that. That's probably a couple hours, couple days, couple years discussion. I only have 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to propose that the difference in uh, the foliar nutrient levels is again due to site factors, namely the soil texture, the cation exchange capacity of the soil, and the soil moisture. It's generally easier to move nutrients through moist soil than it is through dry soil general. Again, site factors for management technique that was uh, identical in both. What? Oh, I'm here already. Okay. Questions. I have one. Remember those parents? So I'm wondering, are there relationships between where a parent's tree Beck subvariant, these, these trees all came from SBS, and uh, where their progeny clone kids are planted in a specific um, site series, in this case, IDF MW203 or 05. To me, it looks kind of like IDF MW205 is a bit of a sweet spot for trees, for pine trees, specifically from this Beck zone. That's kind of as far as I want. I wouldn't want to make a broad statement about all trees from all places in the province. But I'm wondering if there are relationships like that that we can look at. Um, hopefully you agree with me that site factors play a big role in um, seed production. I think they're a reasonable cause of the differences in seed production. These two polygons are right next to each other. We manage them exactly the same. The only big differences are uh, site factors. and Some of those differences are pretty big. A lot of them are like just looking at the soils. That's a big difference. And if that's the case, uh, I, I propose that it might be a good idea for us to classify our existing orchard into Beck site series. Because once you classify it that way, well, one, you're taking advantage of a very, very well-developed system to describe forest ecosystems. All of BC forestry is based on it. Everything we do, um, deployment areas where you can plant, is uh, based on the Beck system. And if we're all using the same 
same technique to describe our orchards, very systematic. You can all understand each other, talk in the same language using, using the, same, uh, the same system. Um, forest ecologists and forest, um, forest researchers also use it and they tend to develop tools. And here's one, uh, Hardy Greisbauer presented this at, in 2019 at ITAC. And then Craig DeLong presented it this year at uh, Cisco. Vanessa Ford is leading the charge on this. This is a tool, drought risk assessment tool. So if you know the species, that's easy. If you know where you are, I know where I am, or I know where the orchard trees are, are the soil moisture regime. This is, this is not our site. This is a, a slide I got from Craig. And if you know something about the climate, the, uh, as, as expressed by the soil moisture regime, and we can predict the climate out into the future, you can uh, predict how drought resistant or how the, the stress your tree is going to be under on that site out into the future. I wanted to apply this to my 0305 site. Um, if you're an orchard manager or planner or a geneticist, I bet Nick Ukranis has something to say about this because he saw this as well. You could use this to project out into the future for your orchards if you know the back site series of where you want your orchard or where it is. And that's about it. Here's some interesting reading. If you want to read some more, I'm sure you've all read more than I have on this. And that's about it. Thanks. Apologies to Robert and to